Hi there, my name is Jerry Mikulski, and it is two days before the 2016 general election on November 8th. By the time I get this out, it'll be tonight, so it'll really be one day before the election. And uh, clearly we're in front of a really remarkable moment, and I'd like to take a, a moment to try to explain why did Trump rise, why did this all happen right now, and what might we do now? I'll do this by talking about why people are supporting Trump, uh, why this all is of the moment right now and what we might actually do. Uh, and if you're a conservative listening to this, I'm clearly tilting the other way. Uh, please hang in there because I think you'll find in, find things in here that resonate with, um, with your thinking. So let's dive in. The TLDR, the too long didn't read answer is that this is really complicated. So this is not a three minute video. In fact, it'll take considerably longer to get through these issues. Let's start with why people support Trump. And I'm going to quote Hillary's uh, deplorables comment. I'm going to say that some part of the human population and some part of the US population is xenophobes and Islamophobes and the KKK and neo-Nazis and nativists. Uh, and uh, there's a blurry line because there's racism and sexism and homophobia in a much larger piece of the population. And I don't mean that everybody who has sexism is a deplorable, but I mean that the hardcore racists who are really pushing this uh, are in fact deplorables. Uh, I'm foreshadowing on the left, it says see ghosts. What I mean is there's a section coming up where, we, where I say that we haven't really dealt with our ghosts. Uh, Donald Trump has ripped open the Overton window. He has brought deplorables into mainstream discourse. The Overton window is basically the window of what's okay to talk about. Uh, so acceptable discourse, there's kind of like, well, we do this, but we don't name names or we don't insult people. Trump has just shredded this Overton window. And what he's done is he's opened a wide enough space for uh, these deplorables to step in and become part of mainstream discourse. There's also a bunch of gullibles, and I'm sorry, I'm just gonna call them gullibles because after 30 years of very careful training by the conservative machine, they believe that Hillary will take our guns, that Hillary is gonna open all the borders, that Hillary is a criminal, that Hillary and Obama are Satan, all those kinds of things. And I just have to tell you, she's pretty much not gonna take down the Second Amendment. She's no, no desire to throw open all the borders. Uh, and, and she and Obama don't smell like sulfur. They really aren't Satan. Uh, you can all calm down a little bit. Uh, but you're also gullible in that you believe that Trump is the best businessman. And in retrospect, I have to say that, uh, you know, several years of The Apprentice and Celebrity Apprentice is a genius strategy to tell the American public that you are the best businessman, even though uh, Trump's business affairs are a train wreck, a continuous and ongoing train wreck, in particular shafting everybody he's dealt with. It's insane. Uh, and ending up with less money, uh, even though he's a billionaire, ending up with less money at this point than if he had just invested the stuff that his dad gave him when he started. So Trump as the best businessman, you're pretty gullible too. That the economy is a shambles? No, there are some people in the population who are suffering. I'm with you on that and I'll get to that. But the economy is far from a shambles. Crime is not at all time highs. It's in fact close to all time lows. Nobody respects America, maybe because we're contemplating electing Donald Trump, but actually respect for America is pretty damn high. And oh, we're going to get internment camps in the US. The, the country's run by lizard people. Come on, people, get a grip. You're gullible and you need to sort of wake up and read around. Now, I'm, I'm looking ahead a little bit here because conservatives in some sense are reaping what they sowed over the last 30 years. And I'll get, I'll get to that history in just a second. There's other reasons why one might support Trump. Uh, hey, he's really not such a threat. He's, he's all talk, no bluster. Well, you know what? His record doesn't indicate that. His record indicates that he is a hip shooter. Uh, he, he is happy to aim high and try for stuff. He will do pretty much anything. Uh, Scott Adams has taken a kind of a peculiar approach. This is the, the, the author of Dilbert. He's taken a very peculiar approach of shifting his uh, support from Hillary to, uh, to Trump, in particular because Trump seems to be a master of persuasion. And here Robert Cialdini and sort of the dark arts of persuasion rise to the fore. And what Adams is saying is that we need the best salesman possible. And that happens to be Donald Trump because nobody can touch him on selling these sorts of ideas. And I think that logic is completely wet. Um, I do admire Trump's sales strategy. We'll get to that. I think it's one of his core skills. But I don't think what we need is an unprincipled sales guy. 
You might be voting for Trump out of spite or to scare the system or just to roll the dice. I mean, I kind of get that. But really, when the stakes are this high, you don't want to be just trying to scare the system. Uh, you might think we need a real authoritarian. And boy, I've seen that plot come a couple times. I grew up in South America and I watched Argentine dictatorships sort of come and go. Uh, that doesn't go well. And then, and this is not the first time I'm going to, not the last time I'm going to mention uh, Adolf Hitler, but, you know, Hitler won an election. He ran against democracy. When he was running, he said, look at this crap. It was the middle of the Great Depression, 1933-34. And he said, look at what's happening in democratic countries. They are falling apart. They have riots in the streets. You need somebody who knows how to control things. And only I can do that. Sound familiar? You may also believe all the conspiracy theories that I alluded to a moment ago that, that you know, there's, there's murders and, and giant conspiracies. Uh, most of those uh, are false. There's a little bit of people behind the scenes doing things, and I'll get to that. A lot of it's on the conservative side. Or you may be Russian or in some other way wishing that America were weaker on the global stage. And, you know, Trump's great for Russia. In fact, uh, if Trump gets elected, I'm pretty sure Putin's going to go for uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, maybe Poland who knows whether Hungary. Hungary's already got a far right uh, guy in charge. So who knows, that might actually work. Um, there's a bunch of conservatives who are holding their noses and voting for Donald because, and it's often one issue. Uh, the, one, the main issue, I think, is that uh, right now there is an empty seat on the Supreme Court. Uh, there will very likely be over the next four or eight years, the next one or two administrations, maybe three seats open, which means whoever the person is who gets to nominate those people, if they pass, uh, will actually tilt the court substantially. It'll either swing very uh, far right or maybe not far left. I, th I think if Donald gets in power, he'll try everything he can to go far right. Uh, but if Hillary comes in, I don't think anybody's going to let her swing far left. So I think it's going to be pretty moderate, moderate like Garland right now. Or maybe it's reproductive rights and you're a one issue voter about uh, abortion uh, should be illegal and so forth. Maybe more it's party loyalty. I always vote Republican. I'm just going to vote the party line and hold my nose. Um, you're holding your nose because things really stink. I'll, I'll get there in a sec. Um, you may also believe that any democratic success and we're going to be out of power forever. And I'll say that this has been a note in the background for 30 years. Uh, I'll talk in a moment about the GOP's scorched earth strategies and, and what's been happening. But, but the idea that a Democratic president might achieve something is anathema to conservatives because that might mean that one Democrat might succeed, another might succeed, another. And then we'd look back and say, hey, look at this record of success. Our, our electoral system, our political system is set up so that nobody really wants the other party to succeed, which means everybody's really working against the interests of the country. And that's kind of this last point, is that a lot of conservatives may see that their job security is more important than our national security. That having a stalemate in government, that putting in some guy who might actually push the button on nukes, that whatever it is that might happen, but would keep them in their nice, cozy power seat is much more important than those outcomes. And I've got to say, I would hold my nose talking to you because that's a pretty unprincipled, pretty unethical uh, stance to take. So it's, it's amazing to me that, that Donald Trump at this moment has more than 40% of the country backing him. At least that's what polls say, if you believe any polls. Given his absolutely proven misogyny and assaults on women, uh, and I don't mean just that he's had affairs. I mean, Newt Gingrich has had affairs, Bill Clinton has had affairs. I mean that he seriously seems to think of women as nothing more than objects to fuck. And he's just dive, he's gone straight into that over and over again. And I don't think it's just an act. I think, in fact, he is deep down, right, nice and to the core, a misogynist. Uh, his continuous incredible lying. I don't mean just sort of lying a little like fudging the truth. Hillary fudges the truth because the truth has beat her on the head before. You know, things, things have landed on the Clintons really hard. But when Donald uh, just yesterday says, hey, you should have seen how Obama dealt with that heckler, that, that uh, Trump supported guy who showed up at, the, the, at their talk, um, he was screaming at him. It was awful. I, I'm totally ashamed. If you actually watch the video, of Obama handling the heckler, you will see somebody who is principled and polite and respectful and saying, this person uh, is ex-military, is older and, and has a different opinion. And we live in a democracy. And for these reasons, we should respect. So 
good God, like, like Donald has the big brassy balls to lie all the time and to manufacture his own reality. We'll get to that in a little bit too. He is a narcissist. Everything he does is self-serving. He is ignorant and doesn't have any curiosity. Uh, there's some very good articles about his total lack of a moral center or a moral compass. He does not listen or apologize to anyone for anything. He might have listened a little bit in this last little period to people saying, hey, use the teleprompter and stop running off message so much. Uh, and if you think his apology about the uh, grab them by the whatever uh, comments was really an apology. Just listen to it for a second. He said, gosh, I'm really sorry for that thing that Hillary started, et cetera, et cetera. So he really doesn't know how to apologize. And he's doing this in the middle of an, a world of insane double standards. I mean, the things that Hillary has to live up to and the things she gets bas for, bashed for compared to the things that Donald Trump has done repetitively and endlessly are unbelievable. And this, this sets up a, a world of false equivalence where things seem to be similar all the time. There's a lovely cartoon, which is, you know, Donald Trump did this and that. Uh, and then the next slide is, and Hillary Clinton has uh, spinach in her teeth. And then the reporters are saying, well, well, obviously these th two things are the same. And they're not. But maybe Trump, maybe people love that Trump tells everyone to fuck off, that he is his own man, and uh, that he didn't get this far uh, on his own. I, I mean, he did get this far on his own, and it, it kind of is a miracle. I don't think there's a big room of geniuses pulling Donald Trump's strings. I think he's probably got ties to Putin and whoever else uh, and, and organized crime. But he, he did get this far on his own, which is both an indictment of media and politics. And as we will see in a moment, uh, the way our society is set up. Uh, but it's pretty impressive. So maybe you like that. And you're like, well, let's give this guy a thing. Uh, above all, I think uh, Trump's level of support says, speaks loudly that there is a deep-seated anger and sense of betrayal in the United States of America. And, and, and it, it runs very, very deep. And uh, the Democrats have not been able to lance that boil. They have not been able to credibly address those things for a variety of reasons, part of which is they've been demonized, part of which is they don't have great policies. But compared to the, the threats that are sort of on deck, uh, mediocre policies and a continuation of Clinton, Obama to a new Clinton doesn't seem bad whatsoever. So here are the most reasonable reasons why one might support Trump. Uh, the first one is called They're Cutting in Line. And Arlie Russell Hochschild, a sociologist, uh, has written a book and several really interesting pieces about this notion that that normal working people feel like they're, they're standing in line up the hill to success, that at the top is the American dream. But the line is kind of stalled and they haven't really made any progress yet. If anything, they're slipping and people seem to be cutting in line. Uh, affirmative action, any kind of benefits for other sorts of people or the closing of opportunities for them are, are some way of losing a spot. And uh, I'm not going to read this quote, uh, but just hit pause or come back to it. Uh, but Arlie talks about how this, this is sort of the metaphor that's going on. Second point is loss of privilege. And here I mean mostly white male privilege. And I'm one of those. I'm a white guy. Uh, and there's really, I think, uh, as we modernize and as progress happens and we realize that everybody is equal and we ought to make a society where we treat everybody as equal, whether they are disabled, whatever their love preference is, et cetera, you know, color, gender, um, white males are going to feel like all of that is a loss. They don't see diversity as a win. They don't see equality as a win. They kind of have to, but many don't. Um, so when I say reasonable reasons, I don't mean I'm agreeing that that's, there's a loss of privilege. I mean that there's that very definitely a sense of loss of privilege. A different point is that nobody has been speaking for me and nobody else says the things that Donald Trump says out loud. He is the only one who's calling out stuff. And I hate to say this, but every now and then Donald Trump says, some, says something that I agree with that nobody else has the courage to say. For example, he said that President Bush, W43, took us into the Iraq war um, on purpose and that it was a huge mistake, that it was a problem. And there are very few other politicians who will say anything like that. Never mind whether Donald was in favor or against the war beforehand, separate issue. But he, during this campaign, has said that out loud. And I think that takes some courage, if not just sort of a reckless disregard for, for outcomes. But I think there's a lot of people for whom he's saying things, some of whom are the deplorables, some of whom are saying, well, shit, I've felt this way about those damned immigrants and everybody else for all these years. Finally, we can talk about that. And man, that is, that is really problematic when... 
when the door is open or the windows, the Overton window is opened enough for everybody to just crawl in and say, hey, this is legitimate, let's go do it, because it really is not legitimate discourse. Uh, I'm happy to talk with people about biases and prejudices, but we really need to aim higher. Um, and then a separate reason here, the system is broken and needs to be shattered. And here's a place I also agree. And, and there was that famous uh, flow chart at the beginning of the electoral cycle about um, Bernie Sanders and, you know, shit is broken and fucked up was kind of the, uh, the, the system is broken was the first decision point. And Bernie and Trump were on the yes, it's broken side. And Hillary and the rest of the Democrats were on the nope, it's not broken. We're just going to do, you know, business as usual side. And here's a fellow from Occupy. Uh, and I actually agree for reasons that I'll disclose uh, a lot more in a moment when I describe this idea called the relationship economy. Um, globalization has sucked for U.S. workers. Uh, in fact, uh, kind of the, the middle wage laborers have really suffered. Uh, we've had some rise in wages and, and wealthy people have gotten way, way wealthier. Uh, but the ability to just move work anywhere in the world hasn't worked well. Uh, capitalism uh, does shaft workers, so that's totally legitimate. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that in just a second. Then there's a bunch of other people. Uh, the, the people I've met who, who are like this are in conservative, sometimes very religious communities. And they would tell you, we've been holding the country together and nobody seems to care. Um, we take care of our elderly. We watch our kids. We don't have to leave our, our, you know, we don't lock our doors. We leave the keys in the car. Our communities are in pretty good shape. And we look outside at the world and the world is falling apart and nobody cares what we're doing. In fact, they're against us in different ways. So that might be a reason to stay conservative, even though, man, you'd really have to hold your nose. If you're principled on the, on the kinds of ways I just told you, you'd really have to hold your nose to vote for Trump. Then the last one, which I think is a, is a super duper strong one. If I don't support Trump, I will lose my support, my community, my identity, my job, my whatever. I will lose everything around me that kind of matters. I'm going to cover this in many different ways, uh, from scorched earth strategy to the consumerization of our world uh, to holding our noses. Uh, but this is very, very real. People fall in line over time because uh, this is about their identity, their community, all the different things that hold them in place. And stepping outside of that is a very risky sort of proposition. And, and Partly what I'm asking those of you who fall in this category to think about for a moment, just to consider, is that it might take an act of courage to go do that. And remember, the ballot is secret. The ballot goes into a box. People can't tell how you voted. So why did all this happen now? Why is Trump so of the moment? Why does he feel like, good God, almost inevitable at this second? Um, first, I think conservatives are reaping what they sowed over the last 30 years. Um, after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the, the Barry Goldwater uh, election cycle, a lot of Goldwater lost in a big way, and a lot of conservatives were completely disenchanted, and they started picking out the ideas of Leo Strauss and Hayek and, and a bunch of other ideas. They then, over the years, built uh, patiently and with a bunch of investment from uh, very conservative people like Richard Mellon Scaife and uh, Anheuser Busch and, and sorry, um, uh, Coors. Uh, the Coors family and a bunch of others, uh, they then built a, an echo chamber that worked really, really well. Uh, Fox News with, until recently, Roger Ailes in charge. Ailes, who was a political operative for the Republicans forever. And Ailes fashioned a very, very capable uh, ratings winning news service that was, in fact, creating the, the very thing we're staring at right now. Uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was sort of emulated and echoed by conservative blogs, conservative talk radio. Conservatives, in fact, own talk radio pretty much. Uh, think tanks that were created, American Enterprise Institute, uh, Heritage Foundation, there's a whole bunch of very conservative think tanks that were ginning up white papers to explain why trickle-down economics is going to work, well, it doesn't, why this, why that, and also the religious right, which has been around for a very long time and has a complicated relationship with uh, the Republican Party, but, but has almost always been on board. And then most recently, the alt-right. And the alt-right isn't just uh, sort of a bunch of these people uh, under a new label. The alt-right it really is an umbrella for the deplorables. It really is the people that I, I, I would have a hard time hanging out with, the people who are you know, down and dirty racists and bigots and other sorts of things. Uh, and they're now in the echo chamber, and this echo chamber is very, very um, functional. 
I date some of this back to the Gingrich Revolution. So the conservatives basically decided that they were going to do a scorched earth strategy, that they needed to destroy the Democratic Party, because anytime the Dem Democrats would come into party, if they achieved anything, they might stay in power, as I said earlier. So back under Gingrich, uh, in 94, Gingrich becomes Speaker of the House, and we also have uh, the midterm elections in the US, big Republican victory, they're called the Republican Revolution, based on something called the Contract with America. And they had signatories to the contract, which were a bunch of people, and all of a sudden, Republicans were separated from Democrats. Democrats. And, and uh, you may have proof otherwise, but as far as I understand it, before this moment, Republicans and Democrats used to rent apartments together near the Capitol, and they would sort of share rooms. They used to dine together in the same dining halls. They used to work out together. It was okay for them to sit and talk in the hallways. After the Gingrich Revolution, it was not. Uh, your money was going to be taken away. You would, you were not going to pass your next uh, primary, which on the Republican side is the important thing to do is to do in your primary. And going off message was penalized with being cut off. It was really draconian. Uh, you are not to talk to the other side. You are not to compromise. Uh, you are not to allow for any Democratic victories. And just look at the history of Obamacare. Uh, going through, uh, there have been more than a dozen extremely uh, tough efforts by conservatives to take down, to first to prevent, then to take down, and now still to reverse Obamacare. And of course, Trump's first pledge when he, uh, when, if and when he's elected, is to reverse Obamacare. So just watch how hard won any Democratic victories actually are. So this has become a land of obstructionism, which I think really is on the Republican side. Republicans held the country hostage and shut down the government, all these sorts of things. And guess what? Obstructionism is, in fact, a self-fulfilling prophecy, which ironically is playing out for Donald Trump right now, because what happens is it gives you a non-functioning Congress. It gives you deadlock in other sorts of places. If you won't approve uh, an, an, even, an odd numbered Supreme Court justice, then you'll get deadlocks in the Supreme Court. So all of this, the party of no has done such a great job with this that we are now kind of in, in these uh, dangerous quarters. So there have been many different movements on the conservative side, from something called movement conservatives to the neocons that gave us the contract with America. Then the Tea Party sprung up and kind of scared everybody and changed the nature of primaries. More recently, the House Freedom Caucus has been doing this scorched earth strategy that will brook no compromise. And now the alt-right is in the mix. Uh, there's a good article on Vox. The Republicans waged a three-decade war on government. They got Trump. I highly recommend you read it. So the strategy is, hey, let's shut down discourse. In fact, uh, there's a, a strategy I call denial, a tactic I call denial of discourse attacks, which is just flood the media with so many stupid comments and so many accusations and so much that, that it's impossible to actually have a conversation. Separate everyone from each other. Create reasons for doubt. All so, so, so doubt. Demonize the opposition. Don't just say the opposition, you know, has a different opinion and here's how we do, how we disagree but in fact say the opposition is satan the opposition is evil the opposition is criminal do that disable the media and fog the facts so make sure that the media is no longer a useful tool and uh, the, one of the ways to do that is to fog the facts, ignore the facts, write over the facts, change the facts. I remember there was a Bob Schieffer interview with Ted Cruz and uh, Schieffer was basically, basically saying, so when, and I'm going to paraphrase poorly, so when you shut down the government, uh, when you did the sort of the, the government sequestration shutdown and all that, uh, blah, 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 and Ted Cruz says, oh, I didn't do that. The Democrats did that. And you can watch Schaefer do a double take and a triple take. And then he goes back and asks the question. And he's incredulous that Ted Cruz would be rewriting history like this. And Cruz was the leader of the shutdown. It's insane. So this is happening all the time. Now, in these kinds of battles, in scorched earth strategies, the player that cares the least about losing often wins. That's the problem, is that if you're trying to hold together discourse, if you're trying to be fair about conversations, if you're trying to promote democracy, it's really hard to go up against all this crap. As a side note, uh, Dick Cheney was a big fan of a guy named Robert Boyd, a colonel, uh, a marine colonel who was a crazy brilliant guy and invented something called the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act. And uh, if you're using the OODA loop, you can outmaneuver your adversaries. And back in Bush Gore, uh, sorry, Bush Kerry, uh, 
I, I think that the Republicans understood this very deeply, and they basically blew Kerry out of the water by using the OODA loop over and over again. Now it seems like both sides understand the OODA loop, and they're sort of trading blows in the arena. That's just a side, side note. If you'd like to see an ironic, uh, an ironic way to read what's happened here, read the poem Home to Roost by Kay Ryan. Uh, here it is. You can come back to it. I'm not going to read it out loud. But boy, that's what's happened to the Republicans, and they have lost control of their party. So Trump managed to hack the media. He's been brilliant at it. The day I really realized this was the day that Trump rolled over Mitt Romney. Remember the day when Mitt Romney stood up and said, uh, you know, don't vote for Trump. He's a hideous, he's, he's terrible. You know, things are, this is going to end badly. And then, then I watched as CNN held two thirds of their camera for an hour saying Trump to respond. And it was just an empty stage with flags behind it. And on the bottom was the banner Trump to respond. And on a, the one third on the left was, a, the, you know, whoever was speaking, the talking heads. He's about to talk. He's about to talk. And then they gave Trump an entire hour of free airtime. Uh, Trump is a master of getting free airtime, during which Trump basically rambled on, did his not only uh, did a plug for his hotel uh, and his usual campaign crap, uh, but denigrated, uh, denigrated Mitt Romney in a variety of ways and effectively rolled over Mitt like he was a little bump on the road. And I thought to myself, wow, what do you do in this case? Uh, if you were running CNN, uh, maybe what you do is you stop the cameras and you step in front of the camera yourself and you say, I apologize. Um, Donald Trump appears to, we, we've been hacked. I don't mean that Russians or Chinese have broken into our servers. I mean that this man, Donald Trump, has figured out how to use us against you. And for the moment, we're just going to turn off the cameras. And we don't know exactly what we're going to do with this. We could use your help on this. I wish that had happened. But Jeff Zucker behind the scenes at CNN seems to be a bit of a Trump fan. So things like that have definitely not been happening. In fact, the opposite has. So Trump has really flourished in our broken media industry, and the media itself has become infotainment. It's, um, we don't really have a news business the way we used to have news that had kind of principles. Think back uh, to Walter Cronkite, think back uh, to the, our famous journalists and the kinds of principles they seem to stand on, Edward R. Murrow. Um, so I've already talked about uh, it's amazing that Trump has greater than 40%. I, just, I put it in here as well uh, on the media, but his skills, um, are not to be taken lightly. So one is black belt media hacking. He absolutely knows how to say things to stay in the public eye. All attention is good attention for him. Uh, if it happens to be bad news, but they're talking about him 24 seven, he seems to really love that. He is fantastic at deflecting. So every, anybody who tries to say, no, no, you actually said that, tries to fact check him. Nope, nope, nope. Uh, oh, I, I've never heard of David Duke. Uh, what do you mean? I don't even understand what white, white supremacists are, uh, despite his meetings with Duke before and his support for them, blah, blah, blah. He's a fantastic bullier. In fact, if you read up on the tactics of abuse between spouses, between people in intimate relationships, uh, gaslighting, which is denial of what happened, projecting, which is accusing the other person of the thing that you, in fact, are doing, a favored Trump tactic, denigration of other people. And there's a long, long list here. I won't even go into it. Uh, Trump, in fact, is a textbook master of all these things. And I just have to ask you people who are holding your nose and you people who are gullible, is this the kind of thing you want in the White House running, arguably, to this point, the most powerful nation on earth? The, the beacon of democracy and free, really? So I did a video that I'm not going to play here, but it's down below about Trump's favorite tactics. What is his playbook? So you can, you can play that uh, elsewhere. So here's, here's the stuff I think I might be bringing to the conversation because everything I've said so far, you've probably heard someplace before. Um, and the thing I've, I've, I'm holding is an idea that we're entering a relationship economy, that consumer mass marketing capitalism is broken, uh, that we consumerized everything in our lives, and consumerization includes industrialization, automation, standardization, commoditization, which means turning non-monetary things into monetary things, commodification, uh, which is basically when you make things so cheap that you can make a lot of them, uh, capitalism, globalization, all those things are sort of the, behind the curtain of consumerization. In front of the curtain is, do you want the Cheerios or the Cocoa Puffs? Do you want uh, the Trump or the Hillary, right? And I think you can see that the electoral process has become a consumer mass marketing exercise, uh, plus media hacking. So 
what happened was we actually consumerized every sector of our lives. We consumerized our, our housing and how we build cities. We consumerized our educational system. We consumerized our electoral process. We consumerized money, finance, how we see our homes. Uh, all these different things have turned into mere consumer exercises. In the process, when you treat us as mere consumers and not as whole people, we break trust, we lose community, we lose society, we lose the responsibility for the task at hand. My only job in the educational system is to absorb the, the material for the next test and you know, barf it back out for the test and then flush the buffers because I'm not actually, I don't have enough time to learn for meaning and to learn for context. You've sort of put me in a military institution that drills me and, and, and has deadlines at every turn. So I don't have the responsibility to learn. Uh, in cities with, with governments and all that, I don't have the responsibility to take care of my neighbor because we have institutions for all that. We institutionalized all this stuff away. It's all sort of part of the consumer economy. All of this took away our sense of agency. All of this took away our ability to perform critical thinking. And all of this went to our educational system as well. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about this whole thing, I did a TED talk back, a TEDx talk back in 2012. Uh, you can find it if you search for What If We Trusted You on YouTube, and I'll put the links to all these things at, uh, in the uh, YouTube comment field uh, when I publish this. So by consumerizing everything, we replaced citizenship with voting. And I, I got to tell you, voting is not really democracy. Voting is a pale substitute for actual democracy where people are, are sort of debating and, and, and figuring things out. We also threw in pro sports. So, for example, go Niners. Thank God for the Cubbies finally winning the World Series. Uh, having some team to root for that feels like your city is a nifty substitute for actually being a citizen and being involved in governing your city. We substituted happiness with consumerism. You can buy your way to happiness. The American dream, have your own house with its own picket fence and cocker spaniel and, and SUV. We substituted community with pseudo community on TV, the shows like Cheers and Friends. We took the commons, which we used to live on and take care of together, scroll back far enough in history, with natural resources, which corporations, are, it's okay for them to plunder unless we sort of over-regulate them. We substituted cooperation with competition. And I actually think humans are naturally cooperative and social. They're not naturally selfish and competitive. You may disagree with that. These are just points of view, but, but that point of view has taken me down this path of logic. So consumerization has given us alienation, apathy, anger, amnesia. We have people who are angry in, in part because they've been treated as consumers. There's a bunch of other good reasons. They've lost jobs, they've been ignored, whatever else might be happening. But other effects, other more specific effects of consumerization, we ended up militarizing our police. So instead of having relationships with communities, which a few cities are rediscovering, including Los Angeles. Um, we militarized it, and all the surplus equipment that came out of Afghanistan and Iraq got bought up by cities across the country. Most cities have SWAT teams. And we militarized our schools. Things that used to be something where the kid got sent to the principal are now things where the police or the SWAT team come in. Uh, and then the news business basically uh, uh, lost its ad base from the internet, lost its subscriberships, and suddenly became eyeball-seeking infotainment and can't hold up its end of the bargain. All of this means that consumerization of our society, which happened, we didn't actively go do it, but it happened around us to us. We were kind of complicit in some ways, uh, depending what you were doing during the time, but we've, we've sort of been born into this. Consumerization prepped us for a Donald Trump, and Trump was the perfect dude to come along and do this. Uh, in the same way, and forgive me here if you hate Hitler analogies, I'm invoking Godwin's rule, I guess. Um, but uh, Alice Miller, a psychotherapist from Switzerland, wrote a bunch of great books, including uh, The Drama of the Gifted Child, which is her most famous one. But in the book, For Your Own Good, she analyzes Hitler. And she talks about poisonous pedagogy in Germany, Austria, Switzerland. And she refers to a book called Struvopeter, among other things. And Struvopeter says on the flyleaf, uh, I wish I'd remembered to put that into the Prezi here, but I'm thinking of it now. It says on the flyleaf, only good little boys and girls will get to see the contents of this book. You turn the page, little Tommy suck his thumb, didn't, wouldn't stop sucking his thumb. You turn the page, and there's a giant ogre with giant shears that has cut off Tommy's thumb and it's gouting blood. And like that, it's basically object lessons for kids. This is poisonous pedagogy, basically trying to scare kids straight so they'll behave. Um, 
Alice Miller argues that this kind of pedagogy, including the German, the Prussian military education system, which we later imported, prepared Germans to be really obedient and to look for an authoritative leader like Hitler, paved the way for him so that when he came in, he was hailed as the solution. He was, in fact, a different kind of solution. So that's the long way around on how we consumerized everything. If you want to learn more about consumerization and this perspective, go to the Prezi link uh, that's at the bottom of the circle. Let's move on to capitalism, which I'm just going to get to scratch the surface of. Capitalism, as it's currently instantiated, in particular in the US, is carnivorous. It really is kind of the giant vampire squid, uh, partly because the market forces that make everybody do really short-termist things and really get in the way of long-term thinking, of taking care of the commons, of doing any other sorts of things. Unregulated, corporations habitually, over and over again, destroy society, the environment, and our future. You can go to many periods in history where we had to do trust busting, we had to come in and do regulation, we had to do a bunch of different things to stop that from happening. Uh, the Industrial Revolution gets really dark and nasty pretty quickly. Uh, I, I can show you a bunch of history on this if you'd like. Corporations really had few compunctions about moving their uh, work to cheaper countries. They really felt no responsibility for retraining the employees that they cut off. Uh, there were no social pressures really besides local communities in distress uh, to make them care. There were plenty of media distractions so that that wasn't getting that much attention. Uh, and they were under insane pressure to behave this way from markets, investors, even the media. So go on uh, MSNBC, uh, go uh, read Fortune magazine or Forbes, and you'll see that, hey, all we really care about, uh, you know, is, is making money. Um, under weak regulation, capitalism always overreaches and breaks things. The problem here is not capitalism as a whole, which I think can be healed and fixed, um, but it's the consumer mass market capitalism that we're in is really cruel. We've managed to cut away most of the safety net. We've managed to make uh, poverty a cruel and dismal trap. We've done a whole bunch of different things. And if you look back again over history, capitalism has pretty much always taken advantage of some kind of population. Uh, it, it basically ate this country and took it away from the locals. Uh, it imported slaves and had a, 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 an economy almost entirely predicated on slavery, a bunch of different things. And, and currently we have wage slaves. We have people who don't make enough money to actually leave their situation, who are stuck in the three or 40 jobs, dirty, dangerous, disgusting, and dull. Um, and, and that's what they get to do all the time. So more on this in just a second when I talk about the ghosts we haven't dealt with. And, and one bright light is that for benefit corporations, and I don't mean specifically B Corps, but I mean also uh, special purpose corporations, uh, L3Cs, there's a bunch of different governance models here, but for benefit corporations can at least let give co companies the, the, the breathing room to focus on social benefit. Uh, role models here are companies like Patagonia. Uh, there's a company in Brazil called Semco, which has a workplace democracy that's really fantastic. If you want to dive deeper into capitalism and its critiques, this is a screenshot of my brain. Go to jerrysbrain.com and you can circle through and search for a thought. Each node is called a thought called critiques of capitalism. Each of those icons below links to, if it's a little A, it's an Amazon, it's a book on Amazon. If it's an S, the big red S, it's probably a salon article. If it's a little red triangle, it's a YouTube video, etc. If it's a little W, it's a Wikipedia video. But there's a whole bunch of materials that I've been collecting about this and everything else that I've been telling you about in my brain. So part of our problem this minute is that we haven't dealt with our ghosts. And we keep rejecting this conversation. And it's funny, I thought of this notion of we haven't dealt with our ghosts, and then it suddenly dawned on me, why am I saying ghosts? Well, there's two books that I read over the last decade, both of which really stayed with me. Uh, one is called King Leopold's Ghost, about King Leopold II of Belgium, who basically took over what is now the Democratic Republic of Belgium and turned it into a rubber plantation uh, with the most insane working conditions for anybody. And I, when I say working conditions, I really mean slavery. Um, if somebody didn't meet their rubber quota, they would have their hands cut off. So there were, you know, there are portraits of lots and lots of people with their hands cut off because they couldn't meet their rubber quota. Anyway, dark history for, for Congo, and we wonder why things are, you know, still dark in the Congo. And then the Ghosts of Spain, where it talks about how they started discovering 2012, 2014 mass graves that dated back to the Franco era, and how the fact that, that Spain had never had a truth and reconciliation moment, that Spain had never sort of admitted to what happened and had the conversation. Part of the deal when Franco turns things over to King Juan Carlos, 
Part of the deal is that there won't be prosecutions. Nobody will really talk about it. But Juan Carlos doesn't do what Franco thought he would do. He actually reinstates Congress and turns things back over to a democratic republic. Um, which Franco would have like gone crazy about, but except he was dead. Uh, if you want to see more about this and understand more how our prosperity was built on the backs of a lot of people, read uh, Howard Zinn's very famous A People's History of the United States and just read it with an open mind. And if you're a white guy like me, uh, don't feel assaulted. Read up the rules of how to be a good ally and understand that uh, it isn't all about you, and sometimes it is a little bit about you, and you've got to sort of be graceful about how this works. But in our country, uh, we haven't dealt with these things. And the 800-pound gorilla in the room is misogyny. And Hillary is a woman. And there appear to be a whole series of people, including a bunch of women, who don't want to see a woman in charge of this country, even though uh, there have been tons of women leaders uh, across the world in many different places, even though she's insanely capable and overqualified, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, misogyny is still a uh, big front and center, and I'm not going to go too deep into that. Uh, instead, I'll talk a little bit about how we've treated First Nations. Uh, there's a reason why right now there are protests at Standing Rock and there's the No uh, Dakota Pipeline movement going on. Uh, if you want to see more about this, uh, go see Aaron Huey's TEDx talk about the treaties we've aggregated with uh, the natives. He uh, is a photographer. He went uh, to uh, to the, the Lakota Sioux reservations, uh, Pine Ridge, and took photographs, but then tells you the story of how we drove them off the land and into the worst pieces of real estate and haven't recognized any of this. By the way, in Vancouver at, a, at an anthropology museum, there are apology letters from the Canadian government, the Catholic Archdiocese, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and someone else that are beautiful. They say, we fucked up. You were valuable. We did this to you. We're trying to make amends. We don't do that in America. We, we hate it when Obama or Clinton or somebody goes and apologizes for something we actually did in some other country. Um, we, need to we need to buck up and look at history. Slavery, man, if this is, if this is not also the, the yawning chasm. I, I just finished reading uh, The American Slave Coast because I met the authors, uh, husband and wife, uh, at, uh, at a speech recently at a conference. And I have to say that I, w I already thought I knew a lot of American history and was pretty jaded. The American Slave Coast blew my mind, in particular in this notion that there was an organized American slave breeding industry and that it was inhuman in ways we don't even think about. Uh, you know, never mind the fancy movies we make to try to depict this, it was worse than what you think. Uh, but the American economy was so dependent on it that they say our revolutionary war, uh, when we broke away from England, was actually a successful civil war so that our founding fathers wouldn't have to drop slavery because they couldn't imagine. Nobody could see how the American economy would work without slavery. Nobody, not the North, not the South. Um, then I'm now watching this documentary, uh, the 13th, about the 13th Amendment, and about how the old plantation and slave system has been replaced by, first it was replaced by Jim Crow, but now it's been replaced by mass incar incarceration, that that has kind of taken its place. No wonder we have a Black Lives Matter movement going on. Um, we militarized our cities, and we have this, this bias that we can't seem to talk about, can't seem to fix, we can't seem to defuse these, these conflicts. So, of course, we have a lot of uh, fight going on. My favorite saying about many of these uh, topics is that the privilege of privilege is not noticing the privilege. Um, I don't know whom to attribute it to. Um, I heard it years ago. And all I know is that when I go outside and drive around the block, I'm not worried about being randomly pulled over and maybe shot and killed because I'm black. Uh, when I walk down the block, I don't worry about crossing over to the other side of the street because some tough looking guy is coming down and I'm a woman. I don't notice those things. And I, I at least I realize that I don't notice those things. Um, so when conservatives complain about political correctness and about microaggressions and all this kind of stuff, you know, some of trying to get the, t the scales tipped back a little bit may sound like persnicketiness or overcompensation. But it's not. These are people who have historic beefs that are systematically ingrained in our culture today because we haven't surfaced them and dealt with them. So that's all kind of bad news. And there's a little bit of good news. Uh, it's been worse before. Uh, back just before the Civil War. Remember, our country tore itself apart over slavery and had a civil war in which uh, like some 400,000 people, uh, Americans, were killed. Uh, so uh, the Democratic uh, the Democratic representative from South Carolina, Preston Brooks, almost beat Republican Senator Charles Sumner to death on the floor of the Senate with a walking cane. 
uh, because Sumner had given a really eloquent speech against slavery. Hmm. Against slavery. So shit was bad back then and fell apart. Also, the Democrats aren't innocent. There's been plenty of stuff going on on the Democratic side. But I just have to say, if you kind of look at it objectively, their strategies pale in comparison, the things they've done pale in comparison, and some of the things they've done, like Lyndon Johnson escalating the, the, the Vietnam War or what have you, or uh, JFK you know, approving the Bay of Pigs invasion, or uh, Clinton uh, basically starting the mass incarceration acceleration, et cetera, et cetera, were in political reaction, were whatever. But, but I got to say, there wasn't this politics of no. Uh, LBJ, in fact, famously was the guy. If you read Caro's, Caro's books on him, uh, was busy trying to you know figure out how to how to wrangle people and how to get some kind of compromise. The bad news is that all of this shit can easily get worse. That we are not at the end of this. This stuff can easily get much worse. So what do we do now? Um, I'm going to divide this up into the next day, so before Election Day. And then after Election Day, there's two outcomes, I guess. Uh, and, you know, not saying that there won't be a fight over the win, but at some point Hillary wins or Trump wins. Uh, so I'll talk about it in, in kind of that direction. And you'll see there's two circles in the middle between uh, Hillary and Trump victories, which are two sets of things that just need to happen, whoever wins, whatever's going on. So first, it's really late. Uh, we're a day away. There isn't a, some of you have been out canvassing and making calls and writing beautiful pieces, which I've been reading and cataloging. Thank you for that. Uh, Van Jones has been visiting conservatives in Gettysburg and doing a beautiful job of it. Seriously, a, a moving job of at least having a conversation that we have managed to close off because for some people, not having the conversation suits their message and their goals, which they're putting ahead of the country, as far as I can tell. So Ordinary citizens are under unbearable pressures right now. People are breaking up friendships because, hey, I can't believe you're, you're supporting Trump. And, and this whole video I'm recording is my way of saying, please don't vote for Trump. This is, you know, I, I can't believe you would still do that, even though I, I think I understand most of your reasons. And if I've missed your reason, uh, write me on Twitter and send me what your reason is and I'll add it in. Um, but people are under unbearable pressures. In particular, all those conservatives who are holding their noses and still voting Trump Dudes and dudettes, um, don't do it. Step up to principle. Remember which side of history you want to end up on and do the opposite. Vote for Hillary. Don't hold your vote back. Don't vote for Stein or Johnson. Vote for Hillary because we actually need, uh, we actually need a landslide, which we're probably not going to get. It's kind of crazy. Um, we can't reverse the consumerization of the world overnight. Uh, the problem is as big as I described. It happens slowly over decades. But the good news is that it's being punctured and fixed all over the place in movements like restorative justice and uh, traffic calming and open space meetings and uh, civic, uh, civic participation and so forth all over the place. The best thing you can do for the next little period is actually listen, really listen to people who are on the other side and about to vote for Trump and talk these things through, have a conversation. Uh, take people by the hand to vote. Make sure everybody gets out and vote. Uh, and in case it's not obvious enough, I had to add this late in the process, vote for Hillary, please do. Um, the dangers if this goes the wrong way, and I don't think I'm being chicken little here. I, I, I'm of, this, of the side that doesn't think that Trump has just been talking and he's going to be really different and he's going to come around. I think Trump is Trump. And his whole record, I mean, Trump might be sort of a, a, a secretly trying to punk us and say, ha, made you look, look, you, you even elected me president, but I wasn't serious. And look what I've done. I've exposed all these deplorables. I've made you all hate each other and, and whack each other. Uh, look at what I did. I managed to turn this country into a dumpster when it was kind of doing pretty well. So the dangers here are that we actually continue to lose civil discourse, that we lose even the notion of facts. We've already shredded trust already with corporate trust, uh, governmental trust, uh, media trust. Every institution uh, is really not trusted very much. Uh, and that things fall apart further with a little nod to Chino Achebe. Um, we could easily see much worse things happen. This could be the tipping into another civil war or world war or whatever else. I, I don't see that those things are off uh, off the table right now. So what are the two things that need to happen regardless who wins? First, the media, the news really need to sort this out. Um, funny thing is, uh, I'm not sure Fox News survives this cycle. Um, 
I think what happens is whether uh, Trump wins or loses, we're going to see a Trump TV network. And uh, the one entity that should be most worried about Trump TV is Fox. Uh, now, Ailes is already advising uh, advising Trump. So maybe Ailes is in charge. Maybe Hannity will be in charge. I don't know. But the, the, the three syllables that must scare everybody at Fox News right now would be Trump TV. And this is a trivial item in, in the larger scale of things. But, but it's kind of a fun, it's sort of a fun thing to think about. Trump managed to weaponize the media against us. He managed to turn TV, radio, print, whatever else against us because TV in particular was so hungry for audience and the news was so divorced from actual journalism and so close to how many eyeballs are we getting and can we get paid more that they were unable to turn off that eye when things got bad. And Trump knew that and took constant advantage of it. He also knew that media attention is short. It's little scallops. It has a very, very short attention span because the media segments, you know, an eight minute segment is a luxury. Three minutes is more typical. So if you can wait things out by avoiding, dodging, denying, they won't stick to it. And the few people, you know, Jake Tapper now and then, uh, a few others here and there, I've seen, a, I've seen a couple of journalists try to stick to it and still not be able to land the blow of you've been lying. They, you haven't just been lying, you've been manipulating. So stuck in this business model, the news has not figured out how to respond. And worse now, discourse is broken and facts seem powerless. Uh, it could be done, but you need to get your shit together, Fourth Estate. You need to sort this out and figure out how to reconnect with the rest of us and earn your trust back. Second, we need to return to civil discourse. We need to dissolve the scorched earth system. Uh, one of my mentors was Russ Acoff, one of the people who invented systems thinking. And he used to say, it's better not to try to solve a problem. It's better to dissolve it. And he gave a lot of examples. He would call Acoff's fables. One example of dissolving the, this, this sort of chasm between us are Van Jones's conversations with conservatives. Another lovely example uh, is ncdd.org. And here come too many syllables. The National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation, which is a terrific group that involves facilitators and other kinds of, of conveners who host conversations about uh, legislative input, about peacemaking, about uh, all sorts of things that have to do with dialogue and deliberation and discourse. They're lovely. So join that conversation and learn from them how to actually have a conversation. We need to come back into community. We need to rediscover our sense of agency taken away by consumerism. We, we, there's a lot of work actually to rebuild the fabric of worldwide society. Uh, there's a reason we use the metaphor of social fabric in that all these little threads, the, 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 the little connections and interdependencies between us are the things that bind us into society. And we have been systematically cutting and shredding and tearing them. Uh, including the tearing of discourse, which Trump has done right now, but, but not limited to that. There's a whole bunch of this that's happened. So we need to make our way back to civil discourse. Then um, what's going to happen uh, with, to the GOP? So what are the, what are the repercussions if Trump wins? Uh, what happens to the GOP? Because it seems like 80% of the GOP is, tr is backing Trump, and there's 20% of conservatives who are either holding their noses or um, going elsewhere. Uh, one can only hope, but they might need to have a party and they might not want to stay in this particular party. I already talked about Fox News of survival, or does this just go further down into Trumpistan and do the conservatives go fascist on us? Uh, so there needs to be a call to conscience for true conservatives here to figure out what, what does it actually mean to be a conservative and can we do that again? Um, or, and I'm just going to put this in here, uh, it might be the entire subject of other people's pieces, will Trump defy all of our expectations, including most of what I've said here, and do well? Will he say, hey, I've been punking you, and uh, you know, I just wanted to, to, to have some leeway to act, and look, I'm going to do good things, and I, I just don't think so. You know, I just don't think so. It's really likely to be bleak. Um, if Trump wins, uh, the Supreme Court will likely be deeply conservative for about three decades because that's sort of how the life cycles go. We are very likely to fall into military adventures and mistakes. He seems to think that a strongman posture is the way to go. And you can't bluff too long with strongman posture. You actually have to send people out to die in your name. And just because he's had five deferments and uh, was happy that somebody gifted him a purple heart. I'm just remembering that now. And I just can't believe how painful it is that an award given to people who've lost limbs and, and shed blood for war was given to a guy who's avoided war and would happily take it. Do you see why I'm doing this? 
We might also lose our global allies, except we might be a lot closer to the rising far right. So let's see, Poland, Hungary, Turkey, Erdogan, uh, there's a whole bunch of countries that are surprisingly swinging to the right. Uh, England just voted for the Brexit. Uh, France might be having a Frexit, and uh, Marine Le Pen is very, very happy in the sidelines, hoping to take her country further to the right. There is a lot of rightward movement we need to be concerned about. And then just loss of progressive progress. So all the things that get, got more equality, whether it's marriage equality or other sorts of things, will probably be rolled back in, in these kinds of administrations. Never mind, and here I come to the one point that I haven't mentioned so far that doesn't get brought up in debates, that is some people's sole issue that really, really matters, and I'm sorry to give it such short shrift, but the earth is not doing very well. The seas are dying. We've killed off most of the, most of the fish species. Uh, the, every part of the environment is facing calamitous uh, catastrophe, including, of course, uh, climate change. And, and for somebody to be running the country who doesn't believe in it and will roll things back. I mean, ironically, when Ronald Reagan uh, moved into the White House, one of the first things he did was he removed, he removed the solar panels that Jimmy Carter had installed on the roof of the White House. Removed them. Paid somebody money to go up on the roof and take down something that was saving them money and making energy. He was just trying to make a point, of course. Um, but I think what's likely to happen under Trump is much, much worse than that. So that's kind of the picture. Um, what happens if Hillary wins? Well, uh, very likely she'll be governing in gridlock because there have already been promises to not approve any Supreme Court nominees as long as she's in office, which is crazy and undemocratic. Uh, who knows what happens? Or uh, maybe we have to get adjusted to a new, new normal that hatred and racism are now mainstream, that we don't have facts. How do you operate in there? Um, so we need to figure out how to fix both the Democratic Party and democracy. And then I'd love to affect some real change. And this is where I liked some of the things that Bernie was saying. Um, and just go back to what I was saying about the consumerization of everything. If we actually trust one another and build institutions based on trust instead of mistrust, good things happen and we can start to fix a lot of these things. That will take us down the road of healing, rebuilding trust, reconnecting with neighbors and colleagues, coping with the future together. Because one thing I haven't mentioned this whole time, Automation is coming, and it is a flesh-eating bacterium that loves to gobble up tasks and work. And we don't have social policies in place where that's okay, because when your job gets automated, it's not like you get a congratulations email that says, hey, you get to go work on the farm now and raise beets and goats, and you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. No, no, no. What happens is you've just lost your job, and you don't know what to retrain for, because the time it'll take you to retrain is probably the time it'll take somebody back behind the scenes tapping away to automate that task. So where do you go? We're in a really dangerous place where we need to be working with one another. Here's the collection of beautiful nicknames I've discovered for Trump. He's the, the rug-wearing thunder nugget, the short-fingered vulgarian, one that really gets under his skin, uh, the giant orange Twitter egg, the Cheeto Jesus, uh, the vulgar talking yam. All these things are, a these are linked back to the articles and the people who, who brought them to us in most cases. These nicknames didn't show up just because the media is biased and people are hating on Donald Trump. They showed up because this man, down deep in his little tiny core, think Grinch here, is an asshole. And he's out for himself. And he's just about to win. He's right on the cusp of winning. And God willing, I think Hillary's lead holds. But you know what? People thought the Brexit was going to, uh, to fail and it passed. So think about somebody who has earned these names. Do you really want to vote for them? So that's my picture. Why Trump? Why now? What now? I'm sorry it took so long. I think you might understand why it took so long. It's really complicated stuff. And then a little bit of framing. Um, first, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I am not a historian or a political theorist. This stuff is just I've, stuff I found and I believe and I'm telling it to you. Uh, you can find the Prezi I'm showing you. Prezi is this zoomable whiteboardy kind of thing. Uh, you can find the whole presentation at the link I've got here, which I will put in the comments on the YouTube video. Uh, if you're in the Prezi, hit escape and then you can zoom around and you can go play the videos I've embedded here. And I will, in fact, add the videos to the end of the Prezi tour. So if you play through the Prezi and keep going, it'll autoplay the five, six, seven videos that I've embedded here. I've missed a lot of stuff. This is sort of my take on things. Suggest improvements, edits, changes, and I will do those. I will also, if I, ha if I have the time, break up this recording into multiples, but I just wanted to do it once all the way through. 
Uh, you're welcome to reuse and remix this material. I would love a little attribution. So this is under Creative Commons by attribution. And all of the things I've talked about, uh, the resources, the articles backing up, why I think what I think are in my brain, which is this concept, this strange little concept mapping tool that I've been using since 1998. You can find it at jerrysbrain.com or look in the App Store for Jer uh, an app actually called Jerry's Brain. Uh, I will warn you now though that my brain online is out of date by eight or nine months and a lot of the really great resources, the juicy resources about this particular race are not in there. But tweet to me and we can figure that out. Thank you very, very much. Uh, vote, uh, vote once, uh, vote for Hillary and make sure that everybody you know goes out and votes. That's really, really important right now. Thank you very much.